Welcome back to the report. Now, you might think that Prime Minister's questions in the House of Commons on a Wednesday afternoon are rowdy enough, but some members of the Kenyan Parliament showed yesterday that they can be just as unruly. Controversial anti-terror legislation was passed amidst interruptions, fist-fighting and jeers. Human rights groups in the country are vowing to contest the new laws. Adama Munu has been taking a look at the story. These are the scenes of what was supposed to be a peaceful session for a bill on Kenya's security. It soon became nothing more than a spectacle of jeering, shouting and fistfights amongst those who oversee law and order in the country. What caused this was a contested anti-terror bill passed into law on Thursday. The Security Laws Amendment Bill grants more powers to pursue and crack down on terror suspects and, in the eyes of its opposers, stunts journalistic freedoms. Even the Deputy Speaker, Joyce Labrosa, was not immune to the tensions and agitation displayed between members of the government and the opposition party in Kenya's parliament. Some of the controversial measures include extending the time terror suspects can be held, which increases from 90 days to one year, granting power to the National Intelligence Service to tap into the phones of suspects and lengthened sentencing. The legislation also penalises journalists and media companies seen to undermine investigations or security operations relating to terrorism and also if they publish images of terror victims without police consent. We will certainly go to court to challenge the constitutionality of this purported law because it's not a law and really want to tell the government shame on you and we want to tell the leadership of parliament shame on you because today you have shamed the integrity, the dignity of the House, and you have also assaulted the very soul of the Constitution of the Republic of Kenya. It is not the first time that Kenya's measures on media law have created uproar and opposition. Around the same time last year, on December 5th, Kenya's National Assembly passed both the Kenya Information and Communication Amendment Act and the Media Council Act, allowing a government regulatory board to find journalists up to around £3,500 and media companies up to around £147,000 if dictated codes of conduct are breached. It is a measure described by Kenyan journalist groups as a dark moment for Kenya's robust media environment. As well as criticism from groups including Human Rights Watch on the implications of the legislation, protesters also took to Kenya's governmental buildings to make their opinions known on the law with shouts to occupy parliament. <laughs> only for them to be arrested, dealt with harshly by police officers and beaten into a police van soon after. The United States, Britain and France have warned of the ramifications of the law in a rare collective statement saying, it is important that the legislation, while strengthening security, respects human rights and international obligations. Protecting Kenya's constitution and upholding civil liberties and democracy are among the most effective ways to bolster security. The Kenyan government has escalated security measures in reaction to recent attacks by al-Shabaab on Tuesday by closing over 500 non-governmental organisations, including 15, for alleged fundraising for terrorism. The implications of the bill has brought to the table the debate on human rights and press freedom in the country, and with Kenya on high terror alert. The question remains whether it's worth sacrificing these fundamental democratic principles for the sake of national security, and will it really weaken al-Shabaab's resolve? Ad Mamunu, The Report. Well, joining me to discuss this is Amanda Thomas Johnson, spokesman for the human rights advocacy group CAGE, and Hassan Kochor, who's a researcher and analyst on northern Kenya and the Horn of Africa. Welcome to the program, both of you. Hassan, this is serious stuff. I mean, there's 500 NGOs being closed down. There's the prospect of suspects being held for a year in police custody. Uh, I mean, it's, it's not too much to say, as somebody did in that clip, that it's an assault on the Constitution, <coughs> is it? Um, yeah, definitely. I mean, and, and you can understand, you know, they're, they're uh, um, yeah, definitely. I mean, uh, the, the reaction uh, by the government, of course, uh, has not just been spontaneous. I mean, uh, the president made it clear in his Jamhuri uh, 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 Day speech, uh, which is the national sort of independence day, that, you know, um, he, he had this rhetoric of, you know, you are either with us or against us. 
Um, and, and, you know, uh, for close observers, of course, uh, this was seen uh, to be, you know, coming. Uh, but the most, uh, of course, uh, surprising thing is that um, this is a very inward looking sort of piece of legislation uh, that is meant to uh, cushion the country against uh, external attacks. Um, and of course, uh, it has been criticized uh, at different levels uh, because instead of uh, addressing you know, the institutional uh, and operational weaknesses uh, of the security agencies, um, the, 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 the president you know, and, and the ruling coalition, I believe, has turned to parliament uh, to sort of uh, extend the powers of the president over, over the security structure. Um, and which you know the president said you know is to centralize command you know control uh, over the you know uh, inspector general of police uh, and the NIS. So uh, yeah, it was a bit of uh, a shock uh, that uh, some of the issues contained in in, in uh, the, the, the past uh, law uh, does not necessarily you know target terrorism per se. Uh, but is an uh, encroachment into the freedom of the media and freedom of expression uh, for, uh, of, 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 of the public. Okay. Amanda, um, just how serious is this and, what, and what's the reaction been to it among other forces in Kenyan society? Sure. I mean, you know, there's been a lot of emphasis on this being um, something that will affect journalists um, and others. Um, but really, we have to look at um, Kenya's Muslim minority as well. Um, Kenya's Muslim minority has been under the pressure, really, especially ethnic Somalis, um, ever since Kenya went into Somalia um, around 2006 um, to combat the Islamic Courts um, Union there. Um, what's taken place is that we've seen um, you know, a swathe of um, repression, of extrajudicial killings, um, and um, sort of marginalisation of this minority. And these laws um, will surely uh, make that get worse. Mm. And we should we should understand, for example, um, that uh, you know um, you know detention of of terror suspects before trial um, has has been extended for an entire year. Um, I mean, why do you need an entire year um, before you can charge someone? Um, you know, will this you know will these people be mistreated? Will they be tortured? Um, you know, may they be you know might they be disappeared? This is something which is very common in Kenya anyway. Mm. Um, so we have to be very very um, more fearful. More in a number of cases. Absolutely, we have to be very very fearful um, and very cautious um, about these laws. I was only surprised really um, not by the reaction in Parliament, by, but actually the fact that people outside the Parliament in the country as a whole, um, you know, weren't um, in, a, in a sort of more riotous mood mm. um, because this is really going to change um, Kenyan society um, for the worse. Okay, well, just let me ask Hassan about that. I mean, from your viewpoint in Nairobi. Be Hassan. Well, what has the public reaction been like? I mean, we saw the reaction in Parliament, all right, but outside Parliament, what's the public reaction been like? Um, I mean, of course, in Northern Kenya, you know, this will not be received lightly. Uh, as, as you know, you, uh, you mentioned that you know, issue, the historical issues. Uh, one of the you know acts that you know has been fundamentally amended, you know, is the Registration of Persons Act. Um, and this has to be read uh, with, uh, with the background of, you know, mass screening of Kenyan Somalis in 1988 and 1999. Um, so what the new sort of amendment, you know, is designed to do is, you know, deal with these historic issues in northern Kenya, um, which will, of course, uh, lead to rescreening of certain uh, communities uh, and mass. And, and, you know, that, of course, is, you know, public knowledge. That is, you know, the Somalis that are uh, being targeted. And then it will allow the director general, you know, uh, the director general to cancel citizenships of this person. So definitely, I mean, much as it is a national. The lines a little bit. Uh, the lines are breaking down a little bit there, Hassan. We'll try and get back to you, uh, Amanda. Um, do you think now that really what we're seeing in the nature of the way that this is being introduced, there's, as I say, there's 500 NGOs being closed down, only 15 of which even the government says has got anything to do with with terrorism. Um, there's clearly an assault on the media. So are we seeing a sort of generalised clampdown in which even reporting of these things will be declared Ill illegal, essentially? Yes, I think. We are, and we have to really sort of get, get this into context. Um, that the global war on terror um, in individual countries has mainly been waged against uh, Muslim minorities, um, but now it's been expanded um, to encompass the society at large. Um, and the pretext, um, as with um, some of the laws China, for example, um, passed earlier on this week, 
um, laws passed in uh, Sri Lanka and laws passed in Australia and um, shortly in this country as well has been terrorism and the threat of terrorism. But we're clearly seeing um, that journalism, um, you know, things like holding people uh, without charge for a year have nothing to do with terrorism. They have to do with an encroaching and power-grabbing state. Mm. Well, I mean, we, we, we've seen the, the language of the war on terror and the them and us that's been used in this case and uh, you're either with us or against us used in this case. I mean, this has spread. I mean, you know, there's virtually a government, uh, there is virtually no government in the world that isn't using this language. You know, Bashar al-Assad is using this language. You know, al-Sisi in Egypt is using this language. The Saudi royal family, for heaven's sake, are using, are using this language. So uh, you're doing an increasing amount of work caged in, uh, in Africa. Is this something which in the region now is the, is the kind of parroted response of governments? Absolutely. I mean, you know, you, you just look at Kenya's neighbours, for example. Um, in Somalia, um, you know, there is, you know, widespread counterterrorism, um, you, know, you, know, uh, you know, measures going on. In Ethiopia, um, which is probably one of the most um, repressive countries when it comes to this. Um, we have even a Briton who's been held there for many, you know, for many years um, without charge and has been tortured. Um, we have, you know, other countries as well, such as Djibouti, where America has one of its largest um, bases um, in the region as well. Mm. Um, so, you know, in, in, you know, Africa, of course, is, is a resource-rich country. The Horn of Africa is an important, uh, you know, geopolitical point. Um, and so you're seeing um, that there really is a struggle um, to, you know, really win out um, you know, you know, in terms of you know, the, you know, the, you know, the power, the, you know, the sort of global power grabs that are taking place between China and America, mm. and we're seeing America increasingly using this um, to try and uh, clamp down on dissent. Mm. Yeah. Uh, Hassan, let me see if we can just get back to you for, uh, for another comment. Um, Amanda was mentioning in one of his earlier responses the, the way in which this crackdown may be uh, directed at Muslims. What's your take on that? Um, yeah, uh, of course, you know, uh, the, the president was very key, uh, cautious on um, because uh, some of his speech before have been interpreted in the, in, in, you know, in the uh, sense that, you know, it is targeting, um, you know, coastal communities, uh, mostly Muslim, of course, and northern Kenya. But this time, you know, he sort of gave it a national cover. Uh, and, and, and desisting from mentioning regions in any of these, you know, uh, address to the nation. Uh, and that clearly speaks to the fact that, you know, they know that, you know, people on the ground in Northern Kenya, political activist leaders, will not take it sitting down. So they sort of managed to be cautious in the way they, they frame the whole narrative. And it's about, you know, uh, secure borders, you know, transnationalism. Um, I mean, today, in his address to the, the nation, the president mentioned even poaching. I think these are some of the sort of diversionary tactics, you know, that, you know, the government, you know, media is using to sort of portray it as a national issue rather than sort of a regional issue. I think there's going to be a response from the Muslim community, in general, I mean. I mean, look, uh, you know, my, my opinion is, is this, that, you know, what has taken place in Kenya, Westgate, all of these things um, has um, in part been authored um, by Kenya's policy towards Somalis um, and its policy in Somalia. Um, when, it went into, when it went into Somalia in 2006, um, the Islamic Courts Union posed no threat to the country, um, but yet um, in a sort of two-pronged attack along with Ethiopia, backed by the US, Kenya went in and this stirred um, resentment among um, the Somali community in the country. And so they've responded in kind. Um, we've seen the same thing, um, for example, you know, in other parts of the world, where one government has gone into another country, um, tortured, uh, maimed, and killed um, extrajudicially, um, and then that, and then p people who feel an affinity to those people um, have then responded. We've seen it from Iraq, um, we've seen it to um, Israel, Palestine, and we've seen it around the world. And this is again um, part of that template. If Kenya tried to crack down even more. Um, you know, in terms of uh, these laws and infringing on people's human rights, um, there will be no good coming from it. Okay. Mandel Thomas Johnson and our guest from Nairobi, Hassan Kachora, thanks very much for joining us. Now, that brings us to the end of this edition of the report. Um, thanks to my guests, all of them, for joining me and you at home for watching. And do keep up with us on Twitter by following at Islam Channel and using the hashtag the report. And you can watch our previous episodes on the playlist at the Islam Channel website. For now, though, we'll leave you with some scenes from Indonesia 10 years after the deadly tsunami that flattened coastal areas on the northern tip of the Sumatra. 
Sumatra Island. Many coastal communities remain vulnerable to the possibility of another earthquake or tsunami, and they're taking numerous measures to prepare themselves. Good night.